Okay, let's take a look at some of the homework problems that you requested that I go over. So here's question number 16 out of chapter 9. Uh, you can read this at t is equal to 0. A grinding wheel has an angular velocity of 30 radians per second. So I can write that omega naught is equal to 30 radians per second. Okay, and that's again at time t is equal to 0. As a constant angular acceleration, so alpha is equal to 30 radians per second squared until a circuit breaker hits at 2.2 seconds. So what this says is that our problem is really split into two parts. Okay, at the t is equal to 2.2 seconds, the motor stops and the grinding wheel begins to slow down. So it states from then on it turns through an angle of 434 radians. So from t equals 2.20 seconds plus, in other words beyond, theta has a value of 434 radians. And then it finally comes to a stop. So omega final is equal to zero. Through what total angle did the wheel turn? So we already know that in the second half it's gone through 434 radians. That's what we got right here. But the question is, what's happened during the first half? So we're going to ignore this part right here for a moment and just concentrate on this first half. So I know that omega naught is 30 radians per second and alpha is 30 radians per second squared. And it's undergoing constant acceleration. So all of my constant acceleration equations become valid. So if I'm interested in what angle it's turning through, I can say that theta is equal to theta naught, and we're just going to assume that it starts at some zero value, plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And so this tells me that I've got 30 radians per second times 2.20 seconds plus one half 30 radians per second squared times 2.20 seconds squared. And all of that's going to give me a value of 138.6 radians. And so the total angle through which the wheel goes then is going to be equal to 138.6 radians for part one plus revisiting part two, 434 radians. And so the total angle through which it rotates is 572.6 radians. And given that pretty much I've got three significant figures, I would knock this down to 573 radians. At what time did it stop? Well, in order to find that, I need to know what the initial omega naught is during the second half. So be careful, this omega naught is not the same as this omega naught here. These are not the same. So the omega naught I'm interested in is the omega naught at the end of the 2.2 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I still have constant acceleration equations. So omega equals the initial omega naught, which is 30 radians per second, plus 30 radians per second squared times t, which is 2.20 seconds. That is to say I'm using omega naught plus alpha t. And so this would come out to be 96 radians per second. So I know at the beginning of this time period, it's moving with an omega naught of 96 radians per second. And later on, it has an omega final of 0. And it passes through 434 radians to do that. So I know the initial velocity, 
final velocity and the angle through which it travels. And so I can say omega squared equals omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. Okay, that's the same as v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a delta x, except in this case it's all angular stuff. Well, cool. So let's do that. Now keep in mind my omega is equal to zero, and this omega naught here is the 96 radians per second. And of course we square that, plus two alpha delta theta, but delta theta is 434 radians. Okay, that's the angle through which it's spun in the second half of that process. And so from this bit of information, I can discover then that alpha is equal to minus 96 radians per second squared. That's this term brought to the left-hand side. Then divide that by 2 times 434 radians. and I get negative 10.6 radians per second squared. Negative 10.6 radians per second squared. That's, that's to three significant digits. So I've actually answered part C here. What is the acceleration? So as far as the time goes, well, I know that omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. This is zero equals 96 radians per second plus a negative 10.6 radians per second squared t. And so t is equal to 96 radians per second over, and actually that's negative because I bring it to the left, over negative 10.6 radians per second squared. Notice the radians go away, which we really don't care about because they're dimensionless. But 1 over seconds divided by 1 over seconds squared is seconds, which is good. I'm looking for a time. And this turns out to be 9.04 seconds. So here's my angular acceleration during the second half, and here's the time it takes to slow down to a stop. Okay, so let's take a look at problem 9.18. I've got a counterweight elevator set up here. I know the radius of this disc is 3.5 meters. All right, that's from the center out. The elevator is raised and lowered by turning the disc and the cable does not slip. So there's no slippage, that's important. At how many RPM must the disc turn to raise the elevator at 30 centimeters per second? So if I'm going to raise this up at 30 centimeters per second, then this has got to be rotating in such a fashion that the tangential velocity is also equal to 30 centimeters per second. but V tangential is equal to R omega and so 30 centimeters per second equals 3.50 meters times omega 30 centimeters per second is 0.3 meters per second and that's equal to 3.5 meters times omega. So omega is equal to 0 0.3 meters per second over 3.50 meters. And that's 0 0.08. 
0.57 radians per second. They want to know rotations per minute. So 0 0.0857 radians per second. I need to multiply that by 2 pi radians in one rotation. And then one minute is 60 seconds. So again, one rotation is 2 pi radians. That's 1. 60 seconds is 1 minute. That's 1. I get 0 0.819 rotations per minute. Okay, in part B, we're given that the elevator is accelerated at 1 eighth of a G. And so the acceleration is up at 1 eighth of a G. What's the angular acceleration of the disk in radians per second squared? So the linear acceleration, the tangential acceleration, if you will, is equal to r alpha. That's at the edge of the disk. So if this is the disk, whatever the acceleration is in the tangential direction, that's equal to r times alpha. And so 1 eighth of a g, so 1 eighth of 9.80 meters per second squared equals 3.50 meters times alpha and therefore alpha is equal to 1 over 8 9.80 meters per second squared divided by 3.50 meters the meters cancel out and you're left with seconds to the minus 2 which is the same as radians per second squared And I get 0 0.35 radians per second squared. I'm assuming G again is 9.80, which is what we have here in Casper. Through what angle in radians has the disk turned when it has raised the elevator? 2.55 meters. So the Y distance is 2.55 meters. And that's going to equal r times theta, which is 3.50 meters times theta. And so theta is equal to 0 0.729 radians So that's the angle it's, it's gone through in radians. Right, that's the angle in radians. And then there are 2 pi radians in 360 degrees. And so that's equal to 41.7 degrees. And that completes problem 18. Problem 22, you are to design a rotating cylindrical axle to lift 800 newton buckets of cement from the ground to the rooftop, 78 meters above ground. The bucket will be attached to a hook on the free end of a cable that wraps around the rim of the axle. As the axle turns, the bucket will rise. So you have an axle something like this, and then there's rope wrapped around it, and then the buckets of cement 
are going to be lifted by that axle system. What should the diameter of the axle be in order to raise the buckets at a steady 2 centimeters per second when it is turning at 75 RPM? So again, V tangential equals R omega. So 2 centimeters per second is 0 0.02 meters per second. That's equal to R times omega. Now we have 7.5 rotations per minute. And so 1 minute is 60 seconds. And 1 rotation is 2 pi radians. I want to get all of this into radians per second. And I get 0 0.785 radians per second. All of that's multiplied by r. And so if I take 0 0.02 meters per second and I divide by 0 0.785 radians per second, this will leave me with meters. And I will get r equal to 0 0.0255 meters, which is 2.55 centimeters. If I want an upward acceleration of 0.4 meters per second squared, again that's the tangential acceleration, so A tangential equals R alpha is 0 0.400 meters per second squared equals 0 0.02 Five, five meters times alpha. And when I solve that out, alpha is equal to 15.7 radians per second squared. Alright, problem number 67. I have a classic 1957 Chevrolet Corvette. The mass is 1,240 kilograms. So mass equals 1,240 kilograms. Starts from rest, so V0 is equal to 0. And speeds up with a constant tangential acceleration of 2 meters per second squared on a circular test track. So A tangential equals 2 meters per second squared, and I'm on a circular test track with a radius of 60 meters. Okay, and they're asking us to treat the car as a particle. What is its angular acceleration? And so A tangential equals R alpha, and so 2 meters per second squared divided by r, which is 60 meters, equals 1 30th of a radian per second squared. So that's equal to alpha, the angular acceleration for part a. What is its angular speed six seconds after it starts? It starts at zero, and so omega equals omega naught plus alpha t, but that's zero. If I start at rest, then omega naught is also zero. So omega is equal to 1 30th radian per second squared times 6 seconds. And so I get 1 -fifth radians per second. So that's the angular speed after 6 seconds. What is its radial acceleration? Now keep in mind radial acceleration is v squared over r but v is equal to the circumference divided by the period. So I can write this as 2 pi r over the period squared, all divided by r, which is 4 pi squared r over t squared. 
But also keep in mind that 2 pi over t is omega. So this is equal to omega squared times r, right? So 2 pi over t, that's just that part right there, all squared. And so the radial acceleration, a radial then, is 1 fifth radian per second. But we square that, multiply that by 60 meters. And I get 2.4 meters per second squared. So that's the radial acceleration. So the total acceleration, you imagine the track looks something like this. The radial acceleration is in that direction. That's 2.4 meters per second squared. And the tangential acceleration is in that direction. That's 2 meters per second squared. And so the net acceleration is the diagonal of that rectangle. So acceleration squared, this is just the magnitude, equals 2 meters per second squared, squared, plus 2.4 meters per second squared, squared. And so A is equal to 3.12 meters per second squared. Now the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And so that's 1,240 kilograms times 3.12 meters per second squared. And that's 3,870, rounding it off to three digits, newtons. As far as the angle with respect to the velocity, I know the velocity is in the same direction as the tangential acceleration. So I'm interested in this angle right here. We'll call that theta. But the tangent of theta equals opposite, which is that component. That's 2.4 meters per second squared over the adjacent, which is the 2 meters per second squared. Notice the meters per second squared cancel, which they should. I get 2.4 over 2, which is 1.2. So theta is equal to the arc tangent of 1.2. And that's equal to 50.2 degrees. And so that's the angle of the acceleration, which is here. Same as the angle of the force, since the force and the acceleration are in the same direction. And then the 2 meters per second squared is the tangential velocity, excuse me, the tangential acceleration. And so it's also in the same direction as the velocity. All right, problem 10.6, I have a metal bar in the xy plane. So let's just draw out the xy plane. And in the xy plane, there's a force of 6.7 more, there's a force of 6.74 newtons in the i direction, minus 2.98 newtons in the j, and it's at a position of 2.41 newtons 2.41 meters in the x, 3.82 in the y. So 2.41 is about there, 3.82 is like here. So there's my r value, and my force is 6.74 in the i, and 2.98 in the j. So that's down about in this direction. So that's f. So the position vector r 
that should be a vector quantity, is equal to 2.41i plus 3.82j meters. The force is 6.74i minus 2.98j newtons. And so they're asking me for the magnitude of the torque. Well, the torque is equal to the i, j, k. Okay, remember this is equal to r cross f. And so r is 2.41 meters. 3.82 meters, and F is 6.74 newtons, and negative 2.98 newtons. There's zero there and there. If I work that cross product out, I get minus 32.9 newton meters in the k-hat direction. So it's in the negative k-hat, so the torque is clockwise, which you would anticipate giving that r and f. Okay, so the direction is strictly in the negative k-hat direction. Okay, in problem 11, I have a machine part shaped like a solid uniform sphere of mass 220 grams. So mass is equal to 0 0.220 kilograms. It's a solid sphere. In case I need the moment of inertia. The diameter is 3.90 centimeters. So the radius is half of that, which is point which is 1.95 centimeters, so 0 0.0195 meters would be the radius. It's spinning about a frictionless axle through its center, but at one point on its equator is it is scraping against metal, resulting in a frictional force F equal to 0 0.0200 newtons. And of course that's a retarding force. So the angular acceleration, well, torque is equal to I alpha, and the torque is equal to R cross F, so if I consider this spinning around an axle through the center, and let's say it's going in this direction, the force is in that direction, it's causing a torque, which is R cross F, these are at 90 degrees to each other, and so this is going to equal, because they're at 90 degrees, 0 0.0195 meters, times the force, which is 0 0.02 newtons. So I get 0 0.00039 newton meters. And I'm going to put a minus sign in that because as I have it drawn, that would be in the clockwise direction. Right, because they say let the spinning be in the positive direction, so the torque is in the negative direction. So that's the torque, and that's got to equal I alpha, but if it's a solid sphere, that's 2 fifths times the mass, but the mass is 0 0.220 kilograms, times the radius squared, which is 0 0.0195 meters, and we square that times alpha.
And so I get 0 0.1234 kilogram meters squared. Okay, set that equal to that. And I get alpha equal to minus 11.7 radians per second squared. How long will it take to decrease its rotational speed by 20 radians per second? That's just omega equals omega naught plus alpha t or omega minus omega naught. That's the decrease in the speed, right? This is just a change in speed equals alpha t. So 20 radians per second equals alpha, which is minus 11.7 radians per second squared t, but this is a decrease, so that's going to be minus 20, which is good because I don't want a negative time. And I get a time of 1.72 seconds. Okay, problem 23, I have a ball rolling down a hill, makes an angle of 64 degrees with respect to the horizontal, it's a solid sphere, it's released from rest, so V naught equals zero and so does omega naught, that's also equal to zero, and it slides down a hillside with slopes, which slopes downward. Okay, what minimum value of the coefficient of static friction between the hill and the ball surfaces have must the co what must that coefficient be in order for no slipping to occur? So if no slipping is going to occur, then R omega equals V, and more importantly, R alpha equals A. So if I look at the force diagram, I'm going to have mg, there's a normal force over here, perpendicular to the surface of the incline, right, that's a normal force due to the incline acting on the ball, and then there's a frictional force here, and that's a static frictional force due to the incline acting on the ball, and then mg, so that's the end of that, and if I do the sum of the moments or the sum of the torques and I'll sum the torques around the center of gravity Fn goes through the center of gravity as far as the line of action goes so the torque due to Fn is zero the torque due to Mg is zero so the sum of the torques about the center of mass only leaves Fs times the radius and that's going to equal I times alpha. If I do the sum of the forces in the y direction, this is the y direction, this is the x direction, I get Fn minus mg sine theta mg cosine theta. Equals zero. So fn equals mg cosine theta. And so going back into my torque equation then, mu static times mg cosine theta, that's fs, right, that's the frictional force, times r equals i, which is two-fifths, mr squared, right, because it's a solid ball, times alpha, 
Notice the masses go away. This is the radius. That's going to cancel one of those. Our alpha here is the same as A. So mu s equals 2 fifths A over G cosine theta. But if I look at the sum of the forces in the x direction, I get mg sine theta, that's down the incline, minus fs equals 0. And so mg sine theta equals mu s times the normal force, which is mg cosine theta. So mu static equals, the mg's go away, the tangent of theta. And that's not right because this acceleration is not zero. So let me redo that. So mg sine theta minus f static equals ma. So let's multiply that by So let me say that 5 halves mu s g cosine theta equals a. So this equals m times 5 halves mu s g cosine theta. This is minus mu s times f normal. This is mg sine theta. So mg sine theta minus mu s f normal was mg cosine theta. And this equals mu s mg 5 halves cosine theta. And so all the mg's go away. And I get sine theta equals mu s cosine theta, I brought this to the other side, plus 5 halves mu s cosine theta equals 7 halves cosine theta times mu s, that's equal to the sine of theta, so 2 over 7 tangent theta equals mu s. And so it's a 64 degree angle. So this is 2 over 7 times the tangent of 64 degrees. And so mu s is equal to 0 0.586. Interesting problem. I liked it.